so. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to our uh, new session of Sabe Talks. My name is Sal Pavel. I'm the host, director of Institute of uh, Sabe Policy Studies. And today I have the honor and pleasure to have with us uh, a friend of mine, colleague, uh, Mr. Guy Philippe Goldstein, a lecturer at the School of Economic Warfare Paris and advisor to PwC and Expo Capital Luxembourg. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Tal. Very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Uh, Goldstein is a lecturer at the School of Economic Warfare in Paris, a contributor to the academic journal of the INSS in Tel Aviv, an advisor to PwC France on cyber security issues, as well as, the, uh, as, well as to Expon Capital, a VC firm in Luxembourg. Mr. Goldstein was named among France's top 100 cyber talent by Usine Nouvelle, a national business magazine. And he is the author of Babel Minute, Minute Zero, Babel Shat Efes in Hebrew, a debut novel on cyber published 10 years ago in Israel and uh, circulated among a few experts and decision makers in Israel, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, so once again, good morning, uh, uh, Guy Philippe, and uh, thank you for, for joining us. And um, um, your lecture will be um, the cost of cyber attacks to corporate values. Um, I'll give you, of course, a uh, um, host. And yes, you are now the host and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Tal. So happy to be here. Yeah, I would hope to be actually you know, physically in Israel, uh, not this time around for obvious reasons, but uh, hopefully uh, very soon. Uh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and delighted to be talking about uh, uh, this topic. So of course, as I'm unfortunately also a consultant, I will have to put on the screen the goddamn slides because otherwise I'm lost. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> let me do that uh, very quickly. Here we go. And this is not evidently the right place to start the talk. This is it. Hopefully everything is okay. Of course. On the screen. Marvelous. Fantastic. Great. So, um, uh, and, and thank you for the, for the little uh, introduction. <laughs> and yes, you know, I do have a very special connection uh, with both uh, cyber in Israel and with cyber, with cyber in Israel, actually, because um, I, I, as you mentioned, I, I've started into that huge field now in, in a very bizarre way, uh, basically <laughs> via a, a novel, a fiction book, uh, and that indeed got a bit of traction. Uh, at least actually, initially at MIT and then in a very bizarre way, but maybe not that surprisingly so in Israel. Uh, and, and, and as you mentioned, since then, uh, you, they've been, well, well, like more than about 10 years ago, there have been lots of opportunities, evidently, to better understand this whole field. Lots of opportunities for companies also to understand how much uh, is at stake when they are being threatened by those cyber attacks. Um, and so, of course, this topic uh, concerns, first and foremost, companies, but I would say that it also concerns in, 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 in a wider way, uh, cyber defense or national security uh, with regards to cyber defense. Why? And that will just a little introduction here. That is that when you start to think about, okay, cyber conflict, where do they take place? You know, where's the front line? The front line is not, you know, uh, at the crossing of a river stream or within a plain, a field where uh, uh, two armies uh, would confront themselves, the actual front line are within what we call critical infrastructure, you know, which is a very loose term, by the way, because sometimes we're confronted with critical infrastructure that we didn't expect. You know, I give you just one brief example. Uh, the attack against, against Sony Picture Entertainment in 2014, you know, nobody would thought that a cinema studio where actors and producers are bickering, this would be a critical infrastructure, but still President Obama at the time, the commander in chief had to come you know, in front of all the cameras to say, we're going to defend that. Um, so basically cyber conflicts, where do they take place? They take place within companies. 
So in a way, the, 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 the tactical field you know, of conflict is companies, corporations. You know, and that begs a very important question, which is, okay, so how, how am I going to harden and, and, and going to uh, strengthen uh, those uh, companies? Key thing as an institution is that the top of institution, the top of organization would be uh, fully cognizant of the threat, evidently. And when we deal with a corporation, that means that uh, both the, the shareholders board and of course the executive committee should be fully cognizant of what's at stake. And the best way for them to really understand that this is a big risk is to tell them that this may cost them a lot of money, basically. So <laughs> there is actually a, an, a, an important national security question so that cooperation understand how much money is at stake with cyber attacks. If you see, you know, all, all the, the links here. Um, so there was a bit of uh, the reason why uh, I myself started to delve into that. And, and to be fair, I, I did that with two uh, important uh, organizations um, in France. One is with PwC France, uh, with regards to publicly listed companies, and we'll get into that. Uh, and the other one was with a, a, a smaller but important actor, BC, which is a insurance uh, brokerage agent or, or insurance consultant, a very important one in France, actually, uh, that deals with specialized insurance, uh, including, uh, of course, cyber insurance. And, and with them, we started also to try to see how we can value impact for private companies, you know, not the one which are publicly listed. And we'll see you know, both of the situations and we'll say actually that there's a bit of convergence with regards to the figures at the end of the day. And, and then we'll discuss you know, what can be the drivers of, of that. Uh, so, you know, this is the, the, the talk uh, in a nutshell with a long introduction, of course, because <laughs> I talk too much. Uh, and, and let's no, get no, into no. that then. <laughs> so, you know, as I understand, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking for about half an hour, right? And then happy no for you have any questions, interrogations, comments, critical comments, of course, you know, very happy to try to respond to them if ever I can. So you know, I give you a, a high level introduction uh, regards to uh, why we need to think actually about that, that cost of, of, um, of uh, cyber attacks, not only evidently at the corporate level, but even at the national security level. Uh, and, and the main issue here is that uh, over the last uh, at least 10 years that this topic has really emerged, uh, we've seen a couple of issues with regards to trying indeed to evaluate the cost. Uh, and indeed, um, the, and that's a positive sign, if I may, but of course that positive sign is a reflection of something bad going on, is that the corporate world has really taken now on the, the issue of, of, of cyber cost. I mean, when we first uh, meet up, Tal, I believe 10 years ago, uh, in Tel Aviv. In, in Tel Aviv University, I think it was. Tel Aviv University for the first cyber warfare conference, you know, that then became the whole you know, uh, cyber week stuff. Uh, it's true that the, the topic was really emerging and uh, perhaps not necessarily in Israel uh, for uh, tech and finance companies, but even in Israel and of course across the corporate world, it was still something very, very new, and even something about a bit sci-fi-ish, you know. Like, and that's why actually, you know, uh, Dave University guys uh, uh, wanted to to get hold of sci-fi writers at the time, like me. Um, since then, the corporate world has moved on, but it took some time actually. When when you look, when you come to think about that, uh, here you know on the slide you've got the global risk survey, which is given by the World Economic Forum in Davos every year. And the key interesting thing for us is to look at the purple squares. Um, and so we see that the purple squares being ever cyber attacks or data fraud or that type of stuff. 
and and we see that actually uh, it's really starting to pick up but for the last five six years basically before that you know like 10 years ago 13 years ago no one match were, were talking about cyber attacks so let's be very cognizant about that and you know then uh, uh, if you see on the screen, it really started to pop up by 2017. You remember not Petya, and then 2018, 2019, and so forth. And now, uh, for the uh, you know, big thinkers and gurus and experts uh, that are being gathered for the World Economic Forum at Davos, it's you know really one of the top three risks for the for the world or for the corporate world you know, alongside with uh, climate change. And actually, when you ask more precisely, not to all the experts, gurus, and so forth at Davos, but actually to business leaders, both, you know, in the US, in UK, in France, in Germany, for the last three years, actually, their one top risk is uh, cyber risk, cyber attacks. And when you, for example, you, you ask to the uh, European Confederation of uh, uh, Internal uh, uh, Institute of Internal Auditors, uh, ICE, ICIIA, uh, which is producing a reference guide for internal auditors risk, foc risk focus every year, um, cyber has become a top risk really for the last, top three risk for the last two, three years. And it's this year that it's become the one risk. And it's also this year, or well, the year 2020, that uh, cyber has become the one top risk for the Alliance, you know, that uh, big insurance company, Alliance uh, Risk Barometer. And when you look also at uh, the uh, risk survey done by uh, the um, the Bank of England uh, every uh, six months. Uh, again, you see a bit the same picture that the one we see at the World Economic uh, Forum. That is, you know, it's really starting to pop up by the mid 20, 2010s, but it's really came to prominence really for the last two, three years. And, and, and still today in, uh, in the UK, at least in the London city, cyber is the top, is the number two risk uh, systemic risk for uh, the financial industry uh, at the city, top one being evidently Brexit. So sure, uh, now uh, the big picture is set. However, you know how much at stake, how much is the cost? This is not as clear. And you know, I still have uh, anecdotes and stories of say companies, even very large companies, for example, in France where um, it's really because of the, uh, the investors, the governance, that the executive committee started to really move on with regards to cyber risk. And when they do so uh, frequently, it's going to be, okay, I'm going to check you know, a, a box, but you know, how much is really at stake in this? How much should I invest into that? This is still not very well clear. You and- um, you know, uh, may I interrupt you? Sure, go ahead, tell. Just you know, I'm 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 watching this table, and 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 it's amazing to see the change over the years because you know, um, um, ten ten years ago, uh, uh, um, 2008, ten years ago of this uh, <clears throat> uh, um, table. We saw, and over the years, we saw different types of um, uh, risk. And we saw things that relate to uh, unemployment and uh, stability of nations and, um, and regions and economic issues and <clears throat> terrorism and, and all those things that we know as may create global risk and destabilization of uh, 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 nations and regions. And when I'm looking on the column of uh, 2018, there are only two issues. There are five topics, but only two. As you mentioned, climate change and, and cyber attacks and all the greens uh, relate to climate change. And all the purpose are related uh, to, to cyber threats, cyber attacks. So it's amazing to see that the shift over the years um, regarding risk, no more unemployment. Uh, well, it's no, there is no unemployment, but the, the, the perception of what is global risk is no more 
um, unemployment or nation stability or um, um, a large scale terrorist attacks. Only those, and it's it, it's quite impressive. It's it's quite uh, amazing. There's, you know, I'll do a little a quick digression here, but there's a reason to that. Um, when you think about climate change, as you, know, uh, it, it's it's driven evidently by what we would call the Anthropocene, the fact that uh, our human civilization and our industrial progress, you know, has moved a lot forward. But as we create new stuff, you know, we're still, you know, a bit city folks. Uh, we don't take into account much of all the risk, okay? So the climate thing is one risk. And as we move forward into industrial progress and, you know, the technological and digital progress, you know, we don't take much uh, uh, or not enough uh, into the equation, you know, those digital risks that are of all the cyber attacks and so forth. And actually, I'm sure that when all the guys will gather in 2022, if they can, uh, and I think they can, I think it's going to take place in Devils, uh, they'll probably add up a, another risk, which is going to be uh, um, social disruption uh, and, and this political disruption as, as we've seen in the capital on January 6. Uh, but that, that also relates actually to further industrialization and digitalization, because in a way, it's also an expression of our talent-based economy, which is not so far distributing benefits in an equal share to all the segments of uh, society. And this is creating uh, this type of uh, political strifes that, that we've seen in the US as we've seen in Europe and as we see actually to some extent also in Israel. Um, so yeah, uh, what is interesting is this convergence by the end of the 2010 decade that all those Anthropocene-ish factors are now really understood as the one main disruptors of our uh, corporate world. And indeed, that's an interesting point. Um, as we move, so I try to understand the, you know, the cost, or you know, it's obvious that um, uh, in cyber, uh, uh, this uh, uh, awareness, this new awareness, you know, is, is is nourished, unfortunately, by lots of cyber incidents. And here on the screen, a couple of, of big, large incidents that happened, you know, in North America, uh, as an example. And I could even mention, of course, uh, solar wind, which is another type of of of, uh, of huge thing, which may have lots of actually uh, consequences that we still don't fully understand. Uh, probably for the next one to three years, um, uh, and 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 of course there's a realization now that uh, you know any one company, if you take them out of three years, are going to be confronted with some sort of uh, cyber attack. Uh, that's an obvious one, and you had uh, this uh, quote that unfortunately I don't know where the, where's the actual source for that one. You know that that ninety six percent of companies worldwide. Uh, maybe an IBM thing, uh, but you know it's it's it really uh, relates to uh, you know the um, both the experience of 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 all any any major companies and the understanding that at any rate, um, uh, you know the saying that uh, uh, any companies will be or has or will be confronted to a cyber attack. But I would say that even now. You can put that in past tense, um, and ever you had a significant, but you know, uh, 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 significant, but that you could control type of cyber attacks, or you had you know a real crisis that is you know a cyber attack who is going to have cascading effects and you cannot control it, and then it goes into uh, major issues. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, that really uh, illustrates why we have I've had this uh, coming of age of understanding uh, cyber attacks. Uh, and indeed, uh, what we understand is that cyber attacks, you're know, going down to that tacti tactical level of a company, uh, can really affect um, all the different elements of the uh, activity chain, not to mention the value chain. Um, 
could be the, you know, the industrial production system. And we have now plenty of examples uh, onto that and, and here on the screen. So these are a couple of very Frenchy examples. I'm sorry about that, you know, including the underwear company that everybody I'm sure have spotted already. Uh, but, you know, there are real examples in France for the last uh, two years. Uh, so Technal, this is relates to Norsk Hydro uh, cyber attacks. Technal is a big uh, industrial company and, you know, all the industrial production system went down because of that ransomware, but also, and that's interesting also to, to, to cite in the confine of your industrial production system, even something which you may think as minor as labeling, you know, the system to label the stuff uh, when it's hacked and it doesn't have even to be through uh, OT or operation technology system. It could be your regular IT, but that is going to affect one element of the production line that you think is not that critical, but actually is, which is, for example, again, labeling. And you have this company, Fleur Emission, which is a, a agro food, uh, very well known in France, and not as much perhaps across the world anyway, uh, but had to shut down for a couple of weeks because the labeling systems you know, themselves were, were, were off by a ransomware, but I believe attacked the IT systems, not the, the all person technology system. And then you can even go evidently into, you know, uh, uh, ransomware that is going to attack the whole general service and marketing stuff, you know, your traditional type of cyber attack with sometimes very dire uh, effect, and we'll go into that. And that's the example of this very nice uh, uh, underwear company, Liz Charmel. But unfortunately, I think it was uh, in 2019, got, got hacked, uh, you know, uh, via uh, uh, ransomware and actually had to go into the French equivalent of chapter 11 because of it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course you can have, you, it can move again around the value chain and, and go into the uh, you know, uh, leakage of uh, data which resided in the point of sale stuff. And this is what we've seen with this uh, um, hack against uh, Sephora uh, retail chain. So net net, uh, you have all this type of cost, uh, which then uh, may translate into, um, of course, uh, uh, the industrial production system that is going to be shut down. So uh, business last, but also uh, the uh, uh, legal aspect to that, uh, uh, data privacy issue that may be also at risk. Uh, and so forth. And sometimes you do see that it can reach to the level of chapter 11, but it's not you know, the norm, evidently. Uh, so that really begs the question of, okay, but you know, how much value is at risk? And again, a key question, because for uh, executive committee and, 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 and shareholders board, if you don't know how much is at stake, then you're not going to invest much. But if you don't invest much, then you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk. And I would say that if you invest too much and nothing bad happens, that's also an issue, evidently. Because the next year, you know, the finance guy are going to say, or the next three years, the finance guy are going to say, you know what, you know, we've invested that much, but you know, we haven't seen anything big. Uh, our competitors have not been exposed to anything big. So actually, maybe we should, you know, reduce your know, the investments. So by the, way, really by the way, I think that's what happened at the first wave of um, um, the coronavirus. I saw that uh, uh, numbers. I think from around uh, April, May, that uh, I think it was a research from Barracuda Networks that mentioned uh, that they discovered from their research that 40% of, of, of firms uh, reduce the uh, budget of cybersecurity in order to tackle the um, uh, consequences of uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic. So not only they didn't um, uh, uh, um, invest more in cybersecurity, they reduced the cybersecurity budget, well, at least the, the first wave of the coronavirus in forty percent, absolutely. You know, it's, it's and that begs mm -hmm. to you know when you confronted one thing about resilience, when you confronted with a crisis, the a good resilient organization is able to both contain the new crisis. So this would be the healthcare crisis, and also continue to run the company as it should. You know, and that's actually. 
the quality of a truly resilient organization is to do both, not to only focus on the crisis, but actually continue also all the other say, regular operations, regular risk that a organization is confronted with. You know, and that, that's the secret of a resilient organization. That's one thing. Um, and then, yeah, uh, uh, the other thing evidently is that the uh, chain consequences that this big risk of, of, of a healthcare of a pandemic thing has actually created another cyber risk, you know, so that's doubled down actually on the cyber risk. Um, you know, that's um, you know, a, a, another element that, that needs to be taken into consideration that was not taken into consideration. And the metaphor here that you can even draw to how much the uh, US cyber community perhaps was very much driven with regards to the risk of Russian cyber attack against the electoral system. And perhaps, perhaps uh, did not focus much on what happened with you know, what then became the solar wind hack. So just you know, to keep in mind. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, it's a crisis. Uh, it's not like in, 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 in fake war games when you have just one crisis and you focus on that one crisis and all the team is happy at the end of the war game because they've been able to greatly uh, manage the uh, simulation because we were focused on the simulation. A good simulation should actually simulate all type of crisis happening at the same time because that's nature and that's how things happen. Anyway. Uh, and that again goes to the question, okay, year on year, what is actually the fair cost of this cyber issue? And again, you know, it's very important to, to, to evaluate that for all the implications with regards to companies governance and the uh, cyber national, national, national security, sorry, cyber defense. So I'll get to the topic because <laughs> I see time's flying and I need to, to get to my big arguments here. Uh, we still have an issue with regards to how much indeed is at, is at stake in terms of cost. So when you look at several type of uh, data, you may have on one hand, so these are uh, figures from 2020. So Hiscox, which is a big insurance brokerage uh, in Europe, was going to say, okay, an average median cost for cybersecurity in students is only like 50,000 euros. So frankly, uh, it's a cost, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, but then you're going to have Ponham Institute, uh, your IBM was going to say, no, 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 wait, you know, it's, it's a 4 million or about $4 million for your uh, data leak, which is big, but by the way, for a large company, you know, at the end of the day, it's an annoyance, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, but then you're going to have even, you know, a very prestigious institution such as the Rand Corporation, which is going to say, no, what the hell are you talking about? Four million, it's not, it's $200,000. Okay, well, it's much less. Then <laughs> you're going to have all the figures that are going to say, uh, you know what, guys, but when you look at uh, small business uh, enterprise, actually 60% of them can go into bankruptcy six months after a cyber attack, quite a big, 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 huge number that hasn't been backed by much of uh, analysis that I've tried to retrace to that number that came in 2012. So I still don't know, you know how legit that figure is, but that figure was in Congress auditions in the US. Okay, and then you have uh, what happened with NotPetya, which was a very peculiar type of cyber attacks where the White House actually stated that it cost about 10 billions worldwide, which, you know, it's a sizable figure because it's the cost of your average hurricane in the US. But net net, you see the whole diversity and you wonder, you know, scratching your head, you know, okay, but what's the actual right number here? You know, is it going to be 4 million? Is it going to be more? Is it going to be just $50,000? You know, and, and tell you when you know, shoulders boards and executive committees are confronted with this diversity of stuff, you know what they do? They don't do much, you know. They're going to say, well, you know what, I don't know. They don't know, the experts who don't know. So we're going to do the minimal stuff because otherwise I'm going to have all these foreign funds, you know, we've got to governance are going to annoy me, we've got to cyber. So I'm going just to check the box. I'm going to at least invest in, you know, one CISO guy and a couple of other stuff and done. And I don't want to hear about it because at the end of the day, I don't know how, how much that costs. 
And you know, I can understand that. When you look at, you know, these are figures from 2015, you know, what's happening for companies that have been hacked with regards to the evolution of a stock price, i.e. their corporate valuation as estimated by analysts and you know, shareholders and, and so forth. You know, people who are even very much involved into that issue of trying to assess what's at stake whenever there's a new news with regards to a company. Uh, here again, you know, we have very diverse uh, understanding of what's going on. On one hand, you may have large companies like Target or JP Morgan. Uh, after big hacks, uh, you know, uh, Target was end of 2013, JP Morgan was August 2014. Um, after you know those big hacks were announced, actually at the end of the day, when you look at the number of days after uh, uh, you know public trading, not much really happened. So you would say, you know, what's the big deal here? Of course, you know, on the other end, you may have situation cases, especially Tok Tok, for example, that happened in October 2015, where you have big swing. But then you don't know if this is just, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, the minor situation, the, the, the anomalies, and actually the average case is Target and JP Morgan, you know, very big, large service companies. And actually, there was a paper uh, back in 2015 published in the Harvard Business Review uh, blog. Uh, that would say, you know, at the end of the day, this issue of cyber, it's very complex, you know, complicated, technological, and so forth. You know, maybe at the end of the day, you know, at uh, traders and analysts on the stock exchange, you know, they don't know really how to handle that, and, and this is it. You know, we'll have to wait for another time, or maybe it's not that significant and material, and this is it, you know. Very bad news for a cybersecurity provider, but you know, this is life, and you have to take that into account. Uh, all right, but then you see stuff such as Equifax, even, uh, where you have big leak uh, uh, in uh, September 2017, and then a huge decrease in the stock price by at least a quarter. Actually, it's going to go down, down to uh, one third of uh, uh, corporate value. Uh, and even an understanding that um, you know, the cost may be escalating because at some point the initial evaluation for the actual total cost for Equifax was $400 million. And now it's more around $2 billion, not the same price tag. Uh, okay, but then people may say, oh, well, wait, wait, you guy, yeah, okay, you're a nice chart and you want to scare everybody here. But Equifax is about dealing with data. You know, that's the main business is create scoring. So you need to deal with data. So evidently, you know, it's uh, they have a data leak. It really touches on the core business. So of course, they're going to be, to be taking a, a big hit, but with other regular business, it's not that important. Okay, but to that, I'd say, sure, but you know, what business today, and it's more clear now that we've all moved into uh, work from home, what business today is not run uh, via computers with regards to handling ever uh, your marketing operations or even your internal operations, right? Um, so of course, um, the exposure is not necessarily the same if you steal a retail operation versus if you're, if you're Equifax. But even there, you know, we may see that you know, things are shifting uh, because you know the digital transformation is still going on, is still moving on. Great piece actually uh, this week in the Economist, you know, with regards to Zara, the big uh, uh, retail fashion uh, company that is really moving forward with regards to uh, retail sales uh, actually taking place online, with a quarter of sales uh, by 2022, which will take place online. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, in, in this decade of the 2020s, what companies would not have a digital operation really front and center with regards to their value chain? That's a big question. So maybe everyone is going to become like Equifax. That's a possibility. So still, uh, okay, so we see Equifax, we see uh, lots of things moving in, in and out, but we still don't have clear figures and clear data. How much is at stake? All right. 
So I'm going back to my initial argument. You know, the one thing I really wanted to present this morning, we'll get to that, which is you know, what, we can, what can we see with regards to publicly listed companies whenever there's a cyber attack? And then what can we also see with regards to private companies, which are not publicly listed, whenever there's a cyber attack? And you're on those two fronts. Uh, so I've run a study, so the first one with uh, PwC France, and uh, you will present a result which were presented actually one year and a half. And there's a new edition which will come in the course of this year. So if uh, any uh, people on board uh, tell, always happy later on this year to, if you're interested, to present the new, new results. Um, uh, and then we'll move into also private companies. So uh, what we've done with PwC France, uh, we've taken 30 companies you know, from 2008 to 2017 and tried to see what happened on that panel, uh, not only in the first few days of trading, but actually no, over three months, six months, and then 12 months to see if we can also uh, identify a long-term or, or mid-term effects of these cyber attacks to try to, to get all the information possible with, you know, with regards to that. And what we've seen is the following. So on, you know, on, on corporate value, We've had uh, about 63% of the companies in the panel that indeed were significantly uh, 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 um, uh, hurt, if I may, with regards to their corporate value and a significant impact, which means, and we'll see in, in, in uh, figures uh, in details uh, in a brief second, uh, that basically for the 63 companies, there was a reduction uh, on average of about 9% of shareholders value one month after the announcement of this major cyber attack. And, and, and minus 9%, this is significant. You're really you know, bordering to a moment where the, shareholding, the shareholders board needs to convene and perhaps heads are going to roll. Okay. And then out of 63%, you have two groups, one 40% the degradation is going to continue. And 12 months later, you'll see the result, but it's going worse. And then, you know, an, another smaller group of 23% in that uh, uh, panel, which is going actually to rebound. So these are your resilient companies. So when we go into details, uh, so, so this is the uh, structurally weakened type of companies. Uh, and, and we see indeed that uh, you know, in the first 10 days of trading, which is about two weeks, you have this reduction of about 6% on average of, of, uh, of corporate value. And then going into after about one month, going into minus nine, and then it continues. You know, and there's an interesting inflection point around uh, the uh, 50 days of training, which is about two to three months. And then you do see after that, you know, another collapse, which may be related actually to the fact that it takes some time for all the information to be gathered and communicated, but especially with US companies where you have quarterly information, you know, after one quarter, after three months, then you have all the information that are that start to be, to be gathered. And voila, if I may, uh, you know, the conclusion may be bad, unfortunately. Um, what may be potential drivers of this uh, structurally uh, bad companies, you, know, you may have bad track records, you know, uh, TokTok actually had been hit already twice before the hit, you know, uh, uh, on October 2015 that really created, you know, that collapse in uh, stock price. Um, and, and on top of that, continuing on the top tech example, revealing of bad mistakes, uh, you have the, the fact that it revealed that some data which should have been encrypted, encrypted, sorry, was not encrypted. So the crisis is a moment of revelation. You know, that's, uh, the, the term of apocalypse in Greek is revelation. <laughs> and unfortunately, the apocalypse here is that people really did bad stuff, you know, for, for whatever reasons. Uh, and you may also have elements of weak managerial reactions also at play 
which is a bit of what happened with the prefix at the very start. Um, so all that accumulated, you get to that type of uh, situation. On the other end, uh, so these are the resilient companies, uh, so the 23%. What is very interesting is that initially, you see the about exact same behaviors as the bad ones. That is, you go down minus 6%, you know, uh, in the first two weeks, and then you're going to go down minus 9%, you know, after nearly uh, um, one month, 21 days of trading. Uh, so very, very similar. But then, and that's an interesting point, you have the rebound. So that means that uh, when you're in crisis, in crisis mode, you really have about three months to uh, save your neck and that of your company to do all the right thing, which goes actually, uh, when you come to think about it, to what is the very essence of the crisis management is to go quickly. Speed is the sense of things, which is unfortunately something that hasn't been understood across many Western European countries with regards to the COVID crisis, but this discussion we're not going to have because this is a way long digression, but indeed, you know, it's another reflection that the, 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 the heart of crisis management is go fast, go quick, uh, and, and go big actually also. Uh, and then you see that it's going to catch up and it's interesting inflection point that, you know, after 20, 250 days of trading, which is about one year of trading, you're going to end up at around plus 6% of stock price because the stock price before the announcement of uh, the, uh, the incident. So what may, I, what may be a stake, you know, we can talk about a couple of hypotheses here, uh, but probably something about preparation, which is something, you know, uh, that is, is coming very often. And which is, by the way, the very essence of resilience, because you cannot really rebound if you've not prepared yourself to rebound. You know, that's uh, you're you're always quicker if you knew uh, what you need to do, not during the crisis but before the crisis. And how do you do that? But well, you you prepare yourself, so you run crisis situations, so forth. Also, of course, you know, um, uh, elements of having a strong board, uh, which unfortunately sometimes do mean that you're going to sacrifice to the, to the gods of the markets a couple of top executives that are going to be fired. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an unfortunate consequence, but an important one, because you, you do show to, uh, to the markets that, uh, yes, you very understood that that was really bad, and you, you get it that it's so bad that you're going to sacrifice your best people you know, to show that you really, you take on the pain. Uh, and of course, you know, relates to that elements of internal and external you know, communication. You know, and again, you know, to some extent, you may tell me, yeah, but guy, th these are the one-on-one -on -one of good crisis management anyway, and you'll be right. And you'll be right all the more so that what is very interesting is to compare those results, okay, with what we've seen with other type of crisis. And here's on screen is a much older study that came from um, uh, Oxford researchers with actually smaller panels of incidents, 15 incidents, nothing to do with cyber, it, it basically bad stuff happening to large companies. And that study was done in, in, in 2000, year 2000. And what did they see? They see that when you are in what they called an inefficient uh, crisis manager, then you know, your stock price is going to go down by an average minus 15%. But when you're a good one, you, know, you manage to do the right stuff, then you go, your, your stock price is going to rebound by about 7% you know, around the stock price before announcement of, of the crisis. And indeed, it's very interesting because it's about the same results that we have had with regards to uh, those cyber crises. You know, the the minus twenty and the plus six percent when you do the right things. So that goes actually to a, a much deeper truth, perhaps. That is that what's at stake here here is uh, your major reputational risk, which is at stake the relationship with your clients, even clear, which is the one main asset, which is at the heart of uh, any companies. Uh, and also to a lesser extent, uh, but it's important one, uh, the uh, employee uh, uh, trust and thus the employee retention and, and all of that. Uh, 
and that's what you see actually on cyber may relate to uh, relate sorry, to those uh, uh, more general reputational risk consequences. And this this is an important issue because uh, there's been also lots of studies that show that especially for large companies. Uh, a lot of your corporate value is linked to your reputation. So there's a figure from Babson College that would link a third of uh, a company's reputation, company's value to its reputation. Uh, but uh, you even have other studies that show that for much larger companies, especially you know the top ten uh, FTSE companies or the equivalent uh, on New York Stock Exchange, actually it may range to 50 to 60 percent of your value, which is linked to your reputation. So indeed, when you are in a digital transformation world where lots of taking place in digital and, and lots of your reputation is, is tied to your ability to manage digital relationships, uh, if you lose out on that particular points, you're going to lose out on a lot of your overall reputation. And all the type of data would show that, you know, so this is declarative data, so I'm not sure exactly what it's worth, but you show a bit of the impact. This was done by Gemalto, which is this French, uh, cheap company, uh, let's say that you know, a percent of clients unwilling to purchase again after a company has suffered a data breach, and up to 64% would say, you know, if it deals with financial information, not sure that it's exactly that, but you know, it does give you an amplitude of how much at stake. So interesting, I hope so anyway, uh, elements. And by the way, uh, so I, I'm, 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 I'm not at liberty to speak more of the new study, which is going to come from PwC, uh, which I'm, I'm running for them, but many of these figures are going to be confirmed actually. Uh, and I will not say more than that. Uh, so big stuff taking place with uh, publicly listed companies. What's on with private companies, you know? the ones which are not publicly listed, where you have less information? It's an interesting question because um, the risk exposure might not be the same, actually. You know, on one hand, uh, uh, there's less exposure to reputational risk to those private companies because less information, also smaller, you know, as I mentioned. But on the other end, uh, because there's less transparency, fewer controls, evidently, and also uh, that's the advantage of small companies, but it's also their problems, more risk exposure, because actually you have executive committee, committees and management uh, and shoulders boards that are able to take more risk, well, actually more risk exposure. And another point also that you have less access to debt and debt refinancing uh, and access to capital than large companies. So net-net, actually, the risk uh, picture in general may be not better than for a publicly listed companies. Now, of course, we don't have data. We don't have uh, uh, stock price evaluation, so it's very hard to understand you know, day by day uh, what is going to be the evaluation of uh, uh, the uh, uh, corporate value of a private company. But we may have data on uh, credit scoring so this is what I've used actually in cooperation with uh, uh, the uh, French Bureau of Den Bradstreet, uh, which is called Altares Den Bradstreet. And we've been using the Den Bradstreet rating uh, and also what they call the Paydex, which is uh, the number of, uh, of, uh, of late payment days uh, to try to, to better assess that. And as we've done with a small panel on the publicly listed companies of 30 companies, we've done the same for private companies. Uh, uh, over the last, uh, uh, say, two years, 2018, 2019. So again, what were the results? So what we've seen on that panel of 30 companies is again here, an increase of bankruptcy risk. So the probability that the company is going to default. Uh, if you take base 100, before the announcement of the incident. So again, you know, these are uh, incidents which were rendered public and, and that's a big descriptor, okay? Uh, but what we see is that on average, you're going to have an increase of 40 to 50% of the probability of default of that company uh, over the next three to six months. Again, something very interesting, you know, that it takes a bit of time so that all the impact, especially the reputation impact of the clients are going to be compounded. And it takes about three months to get there. Okay, but this is the picture that we have. 
so fitting a bit with what we've seen with publicly listed companies. Uh, of course, you know, I'm doing that with French companies, with a French client, with BC, you know, that again, I want to thank uh, for having run that uh, study with them. And uh, when we actually focused on the French companies, a bit surprising, we have actually seen um, bigger uh, results, uh, actually an increase of 70% uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the risk of, uh, of default, uh, which very hard to explain, I would say. So again, this is a, and, and one thing is a much smaller panel of, of, uh, of 15 companies. So I will be very careful not to extrapolate too much about the absolute numbers themselves. What we can say is that at least this impact, this effect is significant. It's material, it's you know, about 50%. And we see that you know, even in countries like France. <laughs> Uh, as we were very surprised about that uh, uh, increased uh, uh, risk, uh, we delved a little bit deeper into the results here. And we looked into the uh, late days of payment. And again, so the, the numbers are a bit tweaked because the data provided by Dan Brasted is an eight months average. So it takes a bit of time uh, for all the information to set in. But again, you see, you're starting with months free, you know, when you start to have really lots of information, you do have, you start to do have a, an increase in the number of, uh, of the late days uh, for payments. So something not great is taking place here. And last uh, checkpoint that we try to do is to compare any one company with what we call their corporate twins. So that is company in the same sector and about the same size. So Ping up about two to three companies each time, to compare with the one company uh, in that panel of, of, of 15. And what we saw is that, uh, uh, again, same industry, same size, uh, there is something going on here because those twins, we have a bit of amplitude. So that's interesting also to try to, to correct a bit the larger amplitude that we see with regards to the, the red line, the, the French numbers for the French cyber victims. Um, but we do see that net net, you know, it remains somehow neutral the, the, the six months for the twins. And evidently it's not for the companies that have been affected. So there again, we do see an impact. Uh, when we try to understand what it means in terms of corporate value, so this is again very uh, experimental, all right? Uh, a bit of an exercise. Uh, I will not put too, too, too much onus on that, but still interesting to think about it. So when I go down to the numbers, you do see this increase of uh, uh, evolution of bank composite probabil probability moving to 0 0.9 on average before uh, incident announcement to up to 1.6%. You may say, hey, Guy, so the whole thing is moving from 0 0.9 to 1.6, you know, what the hell is it about? You know, what's the big first? Well, actually, when you look at the whole ranking of uh, bankruptcy uh, uh, probability, most of companies are very, uh, most of the time about two thirds to sometimes you know, two thirds to eighty percent of the time are below one percent of probability of of uh, of uh, going you know into uh, bankruptcy issues. So moving above the one percent threshold, it is already significant. So a couple of guys in finance in research have tried to try to see what does it mean in terms of uh, corporate value, and so I picked up on a research by a uh, Swedish uh, a prof uh, professor at the uh, Stockholm School of Economics. Actually, he's the KPMG uh, professor at the Stockholm School of Economics, which is one of the top schools uh, in, in, in Sweden, and that managed to. So, if I take a base assumption of three percent growth per year and so forth. Uh, uh, he was able to show that if you move from 1% probability uh, default to 2% probability default, you may actually have a reduction of corporate value of about 12%. You know? Again, very material, very significant. So net net, you know, if I play with the numbers, I may be in the ballpark of minus eight, minus nine with what I see here. So take that with lots of, you know, pinch of salt, you know, I'm not saying that these are the absolute uh, figures, you know, uh, 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 in, in marble, but it gives you an order of magnitude that yes, again, something big is at play. And again, you know, net net on average, 
we're not that far away from what we've seen actually with public listed numbers. So again, we're in the same ballpark that, you know, these are material risk, which, you know, when you are at a reduction of 10% of corporate value would yield to a, a shareholders board uh, meeting uh, where the boards may actually fire a couple of guys and redecide that this is a big issue that we need to deal with. So that gives you, I'd say, the level of magnitude of what's at stake with cyber risk if you don't manage them properly. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of my time. Uh, I don't know if I have still a couple of minutes. You have, you have. I have at least one question, but you have a time, of course. Okay, I will run very briefly into a couple of factors and drivers that we've started to see, especially with publicly state companies that explains was, you know, the type of variation that we've seen. We've mentioned them a bit already and then happy for the questions. But, you know, of course, uh, time is a big effect because as discussed, as we move across time, the understanding and the awareness have changed. These are figures not from me, um, but actually came from uh, Oxford, Met uh, Oxford Economic Trigger. Uh, that during another comparative study of CGI that shows that across time, you know, the stock price decreased uh, right after announcement on the Friday, right after announcement, you know, has, uh, has been uh, further down uh, across time. And very interesting to see actually, and this is some of stuff I'll be doing with a new study with PwC is what happening now, now, now in 2020. Uh, and mind you, we might have interesting results so that, yeah, Every company's, you know, with the COVID crisis, you know, went down in terms of stock price, but it's possible that companies that had a cyber impact before the COVID, the COVID crisis had a much deeper plunge with the COVID crisis because their reputational uh, situation was already impacted because of cyber. So you see an element of cumulative effects. This is a teaser for the next study. Uh, yes, uh, we've also we can also see still from uh, uh, Oxford Economics the fact that you know it's not the same across uh, even the sectors and industries. But as I mentioned, I'm surprised that with time, this is going to further converge. You know, as all type of industries are actually uh, affected by uh, cyber impacts because all type of activities are now run into uh, you know this digital cyber uh, realm that we're all living in, including in this very talk, in this very uh, lecture I'm giving today. Uh, so if I want to um, lay down the, the four main types of drivers that we've seen, there are things that relate to cyber, which is immediately the preparation with regards to cyber risks before the attacks, but of course the quality of incident response that we mentioned but also uh, the digitalization of business activities, which by the way, is something which is being used today as an element for calculating premiums for cyber insurance. But I don't know 10 years from now, where we'll be with that very factor. And another factor which will be invariant, which already is going to stay is your business profile. You know, then that has nothing to do with cyber. But if you're a monopoly company or you're running a duopoly, evidently you're going to be less exposed than if you have lots of competitors. If you have a very stable financial situation and you know, have not debt, of course, your risks are on average much lesser than if you have lots of debt and so forth. So this is also something to be taken into consideration if you want to go deeper into you know, why companies are going to take a big dive and why some of us are going to you know, stay afloat, if I may. Last point, and I'll end up on that, is really the importance of you know, focusing on reputation and understanding that reputation has at least three components. Not me saying that, but uh, um, a professor from uh, Northwestern University, my IMA matter of Kellogg, uh, and yes, you have a technical competence, which evidently is a very important one, but also element of you know, showing up that you're acting in an honest and legal uh, manner, because this is part of your reputation also. And also then beyond the legal aspect that you've been acting in an ethical way, at minimum, you know, uh, taking into account uh, the pain for you consumers and your shareholders. Okay, and that also, you know, you may be doing stuff which is you know, totally legal, 
But if it's not ethical neither, your stock price may be at risk. <laughs> of course, you, know, you should be acting ethically for other reasons, but you know, this is also, also an, an important reason. Um, an example here is again, going back to Equifax and I, I'll end up on this. Uh, but Equifax, uh, so as I mentioned, big shock, uh, shock uh, and reduction of stock price to minus 35%. But then actually the stock price was able to climb back up because uh, they were able to restore their uh, technical competencies, they fired people, they invested a lot and so forth. So, so this element of rebuilding your technical competencies you know, was indeed uh, playing out and playing out nicely. But the problem is that as the story unfolded, uh, you know, people learned that you know, many executives knew about what happened months before it was said publicly and thus the the ethical aspect in as much as they care about the customers, which by the way, you know, are big banks. <laughs> you know, these are the customers of Equifax, you know. Uh, they didn't care much about those guys. And so those guys were not happy and, and, and the trust, confidence, you know, was broken. And then on top of that, um, there were elements that maybe a couple of executives had played you know, with the, the stock price or, or play with their own uh, stocks you know, before it was announced publicly, you know, which is you know, not legal at all. Uh, and that also you know, has in a way broken the reputation of Equifax. So why is that important? As Equifax was trying to rebuilding its technical competency, but had difficulties on those ethical and legal uh, dimensions of reputation, the stock price came back up. But one year later, they announced um, results which were slightly below expectations, market expectations by minus 4%. But the reputation was so much broken that it was minus 4%. The, the stock price actually collapsed again by you know, a significant amount, by a quarter. So that tells you that you, know, you need to rebuild your um, technical competency, evidently, but you also need to take into account you know, these uh, ethical elements and of course the legal elements, because really what's at stake is your reputation and the reputation which is the most important one because it's your main asset, the reputation toward your clients. This is what at stake with uh, cyber attacks. So I'm done. <laughs> Sorry for having been a little long, but it was a, also a nice conversation. So happy if you have a couple of questions, evidently. This is, um, well, of course it was not long. It was um, very interesting and, and, and fruitful. And, and you know, um, when you, I, I saw the title of, um, um, the cost, cost of cyber attack corporates. It was very interesting for me, and and uh, because I often say that uh, you need whenever you 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 heard about numbers related to cyber attacks and cyber crimes and uh, and cyber effects, uh, you need to take it with a, as you mentioned with a pinch of salt, and um, you manage to uh, 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 to. Uh, to cover it uh, uh, very cleverly um, with terms of uh, examining a um, rate of bank, uh, bankruptcy and date of payment and uh, damage to reputation and um, uh, a stock price, uh, the changes and all of that. And, and my question is, um, well, you covered the, the topic of the uh, uh, effect of cyber attacks on, on corporates um, um, in, in, in those ways. But when we see numbers, when we see the cost, and, and you mentioned three, I think 3.5 billion dollars, because how can we rely on those numbers? Because when, we, when you are doing a research like this and you see the uh, Changes across uh, a month or a year in uh, uh, payments, in stock prices, uh, 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 repetition, and so forth, and so on and so forth. It's something that measurable. 
you can you can count on it. But my question is, how can we trust and how can we know the figures that are published that the the damage of this uh, a cyber attack on this corporate is X million dollars. How can we know that? Because you know, it's it's the damage. It's something a bit virtual, or artificial. It's not. Uh, it, it's not a, 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 a physical asset in, in in some kind. It's not something that you can hold in your hand and you can assess the real damage. And in addition, it's not, since it's a, a, a perhaps sometimes a virtual damage because it's related to data, it's related to zero and one. How can we assure that we understand all the perspective of the damage? that we cover all the aspects of the damage. That's why my problem, sorry for the noise, the problem and the, and, and the question is, how can we, at the end of the day, point and say the damage of this cyber attack was X million uh, or billion dollars? So, I mean, very fair points indeed. And your know, uh, issues uh, that uh, with my colleagues at PwC and then also with uh, BC in France, we, we've really tried to, to, to assess. Um, basically, that's why, because we wanted to be exhaustive, that's why we try to move from this or that uh, direct cost, you know, like had your. Uh, X days of business interruption, for example. Okay, so that's that's well, yeah, you say every day I produce that much, which is worth that much, and all of a sudden systems were down. Okay. But as you do that, A, it's possible that the things that you couldn't sell today actually you were able to sell the later day when you had more stocks, and thus those sales sometimes you know can be um um uh, uh, done later you know and you can catch up though it's not a sure thing so that's again an uncertainty and then but this is actually the uh, dirty secret of our whole corporate financial world is that as i mentioned the most important asset in the whole business world to this day in 2021, despite all the great advances in accounting from the emergence of a two-sided accounting in Italy, uh, in you know at, at the very early times of the Renaissance to uh, you know, modern finance and the focus, the dual focus on EBITDA and free cash flow and so forth, uh, and all the new valuation techniques, you know, and including option techniques and so forth, to this day we still have not been able to properly assess and measure the one asset which is the most important to any business, which is your client's trust. And, and these are no means words, okay? Because I give you an example. What's the main difference between a startup and an established business? An established business has its roster of clients, repeat clients that, you know, months in, months out are going to come back to that established supplier, you know. And, and knowing that you have a good probability of repeat clients, that is your main asset. And that's the main difference with a startup, you know, which going back to uh, your Dave McClure definition of a startup, which is a company that doesn't know what it sells to whom and has no business model, <laughs> or doesn't know what is his business model, that you have the total uncertainty of who is actually your client. And whenever you have clients, you don't know if it's going to come back. You know, That element of repeat business, that asset, that confidence in probability, that is a huge, huge, huge number, which is not in any 10K, 10Qs, annual reports that you can you know, look on. You know, this is the most important number 
to this day, you know, and this is a lapse in, you know, in, in, in finance, but maybe you know, in decade, decades to come, we'll have the models based on the AI and, and I don't know what, uh, you know, uh, that, or quantum computing, or maybe simple stuff, you know, just asking people, uh, <laughs> but it's going to get us better to that very asset, you know, but this is what's at stake. And that's why we moved into um, uh, trying to evaluate that through corporate value because actually the, 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 the business, the job of analysts, shareholders analysts is to try to pin a, a price tag on that somehow. And that's also why we try to get that, you know, in a very cumbersome way. And I'm sure that it's developable and I would have fans guys, you know, would say, ah, maybe you can do you know, anyway. But to try to move that with private companies where we don't even have that community of, of analysts uh, and, and shareholders. Uh, moving from uh, the risk of bankruptcy, which is one very narrow way to understand what's at stake, but just to see the variation and this to try mm -hmm. to triangulate to see what it means again in terms of corporate value. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's only when you look at the full picture today, that is the change in corporate value. But indeed, you can have a sense of that variation in that key asset, which is client's trust. You know, it's amazing uh, that you spoke about uh, uh, client trust and it's uh, uh, important. and. There is a, uh, with your permission, there is a, a slide for a presentation that uh, I want to share with you a data. Sure. Okay. Sure. I'll um, stop sharing. Yeah. Um, speaking just about that. And uh, it's from a presentation of mine for the students about a DDoS attack. Okay. What is DDoS attack? Um, no, I need I, I need to share. Um, I need to give to receive the the uh, host. Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay. The question is, and now I will reveal some of my uh, inadequacy at. <laughs> no, 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 no. Everything is fine. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I should go on share screen. No, no, it's not a share screen. You need to um, um, point my screen and there are three dots. And in the three dots, uh, make host, I think. Indeed. Yeah? Thank you. I got one lesson in Zoom, you know, despite all of us comes call. No, 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 no. Do, do, you see, do you see the screen? Yeah. So it's taken from my presentation about it also, and, I, and I'm sorry that I'm bothering you now. But you know, you said it the most, uh, one of the uh, most important thing or crucial thing, um, as professionals say, it's the uh, uh, trust of your customers. And, and please see this uh, 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 figure when it's related to something uh, 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 specific of data attack. Um, and, I give few, and I give few numbers. 78% of security professionals said that the loss of customer trust and confidence is the most damaging effect of data attack on business. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. And here it's specific to data attack and it's exactly what you say. It's, uh, I just wanted to, to, to share with you. Um, um, and it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned that because usually you'd think that it's more like data leak, you know, loss of privacy and, and that stuff, which is an important one. Yeah. But indeed, uh, the fact that a business cannot operate in a proper way. And, that's you know, and, and, and by the way, um, I have a, no, um, the result. Um, there is something I, I, I don't have it. I don't know where, but uh, there is a, a number that mentioned that um, Uh, perhaps, perhaps this one, if you see, it, once a business is attacked, there is an 82% chance that they will be attacked again. And it's related to, to, to uh, uh, DDoS attack. And- um, Not surprised, but what we see on screen is Shingo Nakamura. So I don't know if it's, uh, 
it relates but <laughs> yeah so uh, so uh, it, 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 it's very uh, interesting in the number and and you know which correlate uh, the number of all uh, for dinos attack with the one that you've mentioned um so um Ethan, do you have any question for <clears throat> Just to say it was really interesting and I'm totally interesting to see, to see how the method of analyzing the damage or the cost, not in a, how many dollars does it cost, but in the effect of the business as a whole thing. Yeah, I was Thanks, yeah, and, and as mentioned, I was very interested from, from uh, the, your point of view, how to try to um, understand and perhaps accumulate the uh, uh, cyber damage and cyber costs to, to, um, to check uh, uh, um, stock prices, bankruptcy, uh, uh, latent payment. Um, very uh, uh, interesting and, uh, uh, and fresh uh, point of view. Um, so um, thank you once again. It was uh, 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 very interesting. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you <laughs> once again, Mr. Gifflip Goldstein, a lecturer yeah. at the School of Economic Warfare at Paris and advisor to PwC and Expon Capital in Luxembourg for you know, this most interesting lecture about the cost of cyber tax for freight value. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. Thank uh, you, Tal. And, and just one last thing. No. Uh, so here we presented figures and, you know, I'll be mindful that the panels are not huge, right? I mean, it's, you know, 30 companies, you know, for, for both, actually for both studies. So it was initially really an exploratory way. Um, what I can tell you, so it's a teaser, is that <laughs> we've run a much larger study with PwC, which should be um, talked about, I think, you know, in Europe and the next FIG, the Forum International Cybersecurity, which is France's largest cybersecurity conference. I think we should be talking about that, which will be on a much larger panel. But what I can tell you is that it's not going to change much the picture I just presented. So at least on the publicly listed one, you can have you know, a bit of, of, of trust in, 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 in those current data. I totally trust your data, <laughs> of course, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. It was uh, uh, um, enriching and uh, very interesting. And of course, thank you for your time. Uh, I wish you and uh, Ethan, of course, and all your dearest one, uh, all the best, stay safe and healthy. And uh, uh, let's meet again next week in another session of uh, uh, Cyber Talk. Thank you very much. God bless you. My all. pleasure, Tal. Delighted right, to, to be here. And thank you, Ethan. Bye-bye.